right, folks, let's go ahead and get started. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the third webinar in the spring summer science series that's being brought to you by the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center and the South Atlantic Blueprint team. In this series, we're highlighting Southeast Climate Adaptation Center projects that are especially relevant to conservation in the South Atlantic region. And this is also the June 3rd Thursday web forum for those of you who are used to tuning into that series every month. My name is Hillary Morris. I work on user support and communications for both the South Atlantic and Southeast conservation blueprints. So now we'll look at a quick agenda to see what to expect uh, from today's webinar. I'm going to start by going over some meeting logistics and then we'll introduce our speakers for the day who are Dwayne Estes, Rua Mordecai and Jennifer Cartwright. They're going to present for 40 minutes or so and then we'll have some time for Q&A at the end before we wrap up with a quick preview of the last presentation that we have lined up for this webinar series next month. So with that, I'm gonna go ahead and hand things off to Carrie Furness with the Climate Adaptation Science Center to say a few additional words of welcome and explain the logistics for our webinar today. Um, so thanks, Hillary, um, and hello, everyone. Uh, I'd like to add my welcome to this webinar on behalf of the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center. Uh, we're really glad for this opportunity to partner with the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint team to present um, some of the science sponsored by the Southeast CASC to this combined group of interested users. So I just want to quickly cover some of the features of the Zoom interface that we're using for the webinar. Um, as noted on the slide here, controls are on the bottom left of your Zoom screen, allow you to connect to the audio, which you hopefully have successfully done. But um, if it fails, you can reconnect via phone, um, via number there. Um, and it was also the meeting link information that you should have received. So this is also where you can mute and unmute your audio. So we're going to keep folks muted um, during the presentation and ask you to also um, not accidentally turn your video on so that we can lessen um, distractions during the presentation. Um, in the middle of the bottom bar, you should be able to see a chat window. And I'd encourage you if questions come up during the presentation to submit them in the chat for discussion after the talk. So we'll be um, monitoring questions there and we'll pose them to our speakers during the Q&A. Um, and a note for those who may be joining only by phone, um, star six is the code to mute it on mute your phone. Uh, lastly, we'll be recording the webinar and you can access the recording afterwards in a couple of places. Hillary will post it um, to the calendar event on the South Atlantic LCC website and we'll post it to our science series page on the Southeast CASC website. So now we'd like to launch just a short poll um, just to get a bit of information about who's with us today and help us know how to continue to get information out um, about these webinars. So uh, I've just launched that. I'll just give you um, about a minute to fill it out. And um, or once we get 100 percent, we'll go ahead and close it and then we'll share out the results. But you can that will give us an idea, hopefully, um, about who's on who's on the um, call with us today and um, again how you might have learned about this webinar series so thank you for taking the time to fill this out for us and we're getting to the response so yeah just another maybe another few seconds to fill that out so we can and I'll go ahead and end that and share the results. And that should give you an idea of um, who we have on the line today. It looks like a nice breadth of, of uh, participants. So thanks again for that. And now I'm going to turn um, to our speakers. And um, we do have three speakers today, as Hillary mentioned, and but we'll go ahead and introduce them all at this point and then they'll share um, the presentation time. So um, first in alphabetical order is um, Dr. Jennifer Cartwright, who is an ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey, Lower Mississippi Gulf Water Science, Water Science Center in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, for her PhD dissertation, she conducted field work in limestone cedar glades which are a threatened grassland ecosystem that supports a number of rare species. Since then, her work has focused mostly on climate change impacts 
including the effects of increasing droughts and changing seasonal weather patterns on species, ecosystems, and regional biodiversity. Dwayne Estes serves as executive director of the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative, which he co-founded in 2017. He is a professor of biology, director of the Austin P. State University Herbarium, and principal investigator for the Center of Excellence for Field Biology. His research interests include flora, ecology, history, biodiversity, and biogeography of the southeastern U.S. with an emphasis on grasslands. And he's been active in building diverse support for southeastern U.S. grasslands conservation. Um, our our um, third presenter is Rua Mordecai, who coordinates science for the South Atlantic and Southeast Blueprints. He helps integrate feedback from users, local experts, and ongoing research to improve the blueprints. And Rue has led the development of the Piedmont Prairie Partnership, which is a group of nonprofit, state, and federal agencies working to preserve, restore, and promote Piedmont Prairies. Sorry. Okay, so now we'll start off um, and I'll, we'll turn um, the presentation over um, to Duane to start. Duane, I think you're on mute, and I'm not seeing your screen yet. Right. Unmute. All right, you're off mute now, and if we could okay. get the screen and I'm gonna share going, we will be in business. Right here. How's Beautiful. that? Beautiful. All right, good deal. All right, well, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to also extend my welcome uh, from the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative um, to everybody for attending. And uh, thank you to the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center um, for uh, hosting this and, and uh, allowing us to be uh, a part of this event. So I wanna start off with this uh, beautiful cover slide showing a, a remnant virgin prairie from um, Fort Smith, Arkansas. And this, um, I think just highlights a lot of the beauty of grassland landscapes. And um, this is just a beautiful scene. Those mounds in the distance are not bulldozer mounds. Those are actually about 5,000 year old uh, pimple mounds or Mima mounds as they're called. And now I'll tell you a little bit about why grasslands are important um, and, and how we know, uh, we need to know a lot more about them. So when I was uh, in grade school, in sixth grade, I had a teacher named Tommy Johns. And I remember one of the most uh, memorable things from that class, and probably the only academic thing I recall, was he told a story about how at the time the first Europeans came to the shores of Eastern North America, that they encountered forests that were so vast that a squirrel could travel from the Atlantic Ocean to the Mississippi River. And as a child growing up in the proverbial hills and hollers of Tennessee, uh, it was very easy to imagine how, how that could be so and how that the forest could extend across that vast landscape, much like you might expect or see today in places like Great Smoky Mountains National Park. But I've come to realize since uh, in my professional career that that squirrel would have to have taken a very circuitous route uh, just to get off of the Atlantic coast. And that's because much of the Southeast was riddled with open landscapes of many different types that we now call grassland habitats. And there's ample evidence for um, grasslands in the historical record and in the scientific record. We can look back, for example, this uh, French map from 1720 that shows savannah land and good pasture ground over what is central Tennessee and Kentucky all level and good ground in Northern Alabama and Mississippi, which was basically code for grassland. Uh, the savannas of the Piedmont of the Carolinas, which Rua will tell you about a little bit later, and savannah in Northern Florida. We have um, excellent historical quotes from many parts of the Southeast, like this beautiful quote by Francis Bailey, who talks about a luxuriant growth of native grasses with gambling herds of deer, elk, and buffalo. Uh, this is from the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee in 1797. We can look to museum records, like this map of Tennessee shows all the red dots. These are mapped occurrences of what we call conservative heliophytes, 
That's conservative sun-loving plants that need open grassland habitats to survive. And so by mapping these, it can serve as a proxy for where grassland habitat occurred historically. And again, we can even look to animal records. Uh, certain species like Henslow sparrows and the Piedmont burrow and crayfish have very specific needs and are grassland obligate or grassland endemic species. And we need to thank Dr. Reed Noss, who's one of our collaborators, because he really, quote, wrote the book about southern grasslands. In 2013, he published Forgotten Grasslands of the South. Dr. Noss is a retired professor from the University of Central Florida. In that book, he begins to overview the long uh, legacy of grasslands in the southeast that dates back millions of years. And we are specifically interested in multiple kinds of grasslands. Um, everybody knows about the prairies of the Midwest, but we also had prairies here in the South, large rolling treeless landscapes. We also had um, more than 90 million acres of treed grasslands or savannas. And some of these verged into open grassy woodlands. On the tops of some of the highest elevations in the Smokies, we had uh, remnants of former alpine and subalpine tundra that we call bulbs. In many areas across the interior parts of the South uh, are rocky, almost desert-like grasslands called glades and barrens, like those that Jen studied for her PhD work. And there are a number of types of wet grasslands and some that are even flood maintained. So fens, meadows, bogs, marshes. And in the deepest canyons of Southern Appalachia, we have what are called river scours um, that has been the subject of some former USGS work. These are flood maintained grasslands that occur in river gorges. And of course, along the coast, we have dunes and other kinds of coastal grasslands as well. But there's a reason why we call, uh, Reed called them the forgotten grasslands of the South. And I think that this painting by uh, renowned artist Philip Juris from Georgia really says it all. This is a, a reconstruction painting of what Montgomery, Alabama would have looked like in 1775. But this scene could easily be many other Southern cities. It could be uh, Charlotte, North Carolina in the Piedmont region. Um, it could be Fort Smith, Arkansas. It could be Starkville, Mississippi. So many areas across the South would have looked much different than they do today. And part of the reason they're forgotten is that many of our grasslands were gone before the camera was invented. They were gone before they could be painted or sketched or described. And many areas did not have um, experts or naturalists to go, go through them and describe these early grasslands. And we're talking about staggering habitat losses. For example, in the Grand Prairie of Eastern Arkansas, uh, this area shaded in, in dark red and sort of pinkish tones shows an area of a half million acres of grasslands up until 1830. Today, all that's left are very tiny remnants like this roadside remnant called the Railroad Prairie Natural Area just east of Little Rock. And so because they were gone so early in our nation's history, many of these grasslands are still poorly known. Um, this is really one of the most recent maps of southeastern grasslands by Hal DeSelm and Nora Murdoch from 1983, 1993, excuse me. And it shows some large uh, prairie systems across several different states. But in a recent mapping effort uh, led by NatureServe and the World Wildlife Fund, um, it does not show some of these large grasslands that DeSelm and Murdoch map from the southeast. And so there's generally been um, a lack of recognition of grasslands as occurring in the south. But in the foreword of Reed Noss's book, uh, famous uh, Harvard ecologist and Alabamian and southerner uh, Dr. E.O. Wilson wrote that the southern grassland biome, a term that he coined, uh, when it's properly defined to include the lonely pine savanna, is probably the richest terrestrial biome in all of North America. And to understand, cherish, and preserve the great natural heritage of the southern grassland biome should be a priority goal in America's environmental movement. And I think that's an incredibly important statement. And so um, this is a map that SGI has produced on the right, which is an approximation of what the southeastern gra grassland biome would contain. You'll notice that many areas that are mapped as grassland biome uh, are also included in other maps from the past as forested landscapes. So our grasslands today exist in five states of conservation. Um, in the upper left, there are those like Roan Mountain and some of the river scour grasslands, which are still doing surprisingly well. Many of these grasslands are almost totally contained within areas of public land. 
Um, in the upper right are those we call here today, gone tomorrow. These are doing pretty well now here in South Florida, but by the year 2100, many of these are projected to be lost due to sea level rise. In the lower left, number three, are many grasslands that we um, are still seeing that are being rapidly lost, particularly along the western edge of the southeast region in Oklahoma and Texas, where prairie conversion is still happening at fast rates. And in the lower right, number four, are those that are functionally extinct. Many of the areas of the south, uh, the grasslands, have been lost by in excess of 99%, like the Grand Prairie in eastern Arkansas. <clears throat> but the fifth category are those that we deem highly restorable. And fortunately for the South, this includes about 100 million acres of historic grasslands. And today, at least hundreds of thousands of acres that are now um, mostly enclosed canopy, oak, hickory, pine forest are restorable to savanna conditions. And that's what's happened, as you can see here on the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee, uh, thanks to prescribed fire and selective thinning. So now I want to uh, just say a few words about the biodiversity importance of southeastern grasslands. Uh, more than ha about half of the uh, rare natural communities in the southeast, there's 1,213 rare types of natural communities. Half of those are types of grassland habitats. And you can see a few of those stunning examples there on the left side of your screen. In terms of of animal biodiversity. We don't have numbers yet for the entire Southeast, but for states like Tennessee, 34% um, of our rare terrestrial vertebrates need, prefer, or require grassland habitats. Species like pine snake and Henslow sparrows come to mind. Recent papers last year in Science document that uh, grassland birds are among the greatest group of birds at risk of decline. And, um, and when we look at plants, uh, in Tennessee, back to Tennessee as an example, 60% of Tennessee's rare plants, that's more than 440 species, need, prefer, or require grassland habitats. So with that, I want to make sure I segue out to Jen Cartwright. And Jen, uh, you can take it from here. I'm going to stop sharing. All right. Can you see my screen? Gotcha. See, see Great. you in here. Yeah. All right, so um, now that Duane has given us that sort of grand overview of the history of grasslands of our region, I'll try to connect some of that to uh, you know, current management objectives, concerns, and some of the emerging threats that grasslands are facing today. So I'll start by talking about um, species status assessments and uh, what they mean for grassland species of the Southeast. So species status assessments are uh, fundamentally a process that is uh, conducted by the US Fish and Wildlife Service. They are biological risk assessments um, for particular species. And in this case, we're talking about um, species uh, that are grassland dependent. And they're important because they have real legal and regulatory weight. They inform legal decisions under the Endangered Species Act. I won't read all these out to you, but you can see that um, you know, SSAs are uh, legally and regulatorily important uh, documents. They have several components. One of them is that they require Fish and Wildlife Service to um, perform some projections or forecasting of a range of possible future conditions of the species in question. Um, so of course that is gonna take all of those uh, sort of processes and threats that Duane mentioned um, and, and think about how those might continue into the future, but then there's also emerging threats from climate change, invasive species, and other uh, threats to grasslands that have to be um, considered in terms of the, the possible future condition of species. And unfortunately, a lot of times um, there is a lack of available science really to support that. Um, there may be projections of you know, climate change and invasive species more broadly, but they haven't always been downscaled specifically to uh, particular grassland types and species of conservation concern to provide those projections about ongoing and emerging threats that species face. Um, for more information to get a really good overview of species status assessments, there's a, a reference here. Um, 
So just talking about some of those ongoing and emerging threats in terms of climate change and invasive species, we could, of course, do a whole webinar just on that. Um, so I'm just going to hit some of the very top highlights that I think a lot of you are already familiar with. In the south, you know, we're going to be looking at warmer conditions. So that means warmer winters and hotter summers. Uh, precipitation changes that can include both stronger storms and also droughts that are more intense, more frequent, more severe. Uh, changes in seasonal timing of life history events. So uh, phenology changes that are changing the timing of how different species interact in grassland communities. Um, in wintertime, because we're having warmer winters, we may have more of these oscillations between freeze and thaw conditions that may be important for some grassland species. And we know um, globally that species are on the move because of climate change. That's not just a future conjecture, that's been happening already for years. And of course, that also includes invasive species. Um, in grasslands, like in many other ecosystems, climate is really interacting with other factors to regulate how invasives are colonizing grassland communities, um, interacting with disturbance histories, soil conditions, land use history. So a lot of um, interacting processes. And so species status assessments for, that the US Fish and Wildlife Service is conducting um, need data and projections and models on these processes. And of course, so do state and local grassland managers, uh, nonprofit organizations. And, you know, like Duane, Reednos, their colleagues, um, botanists have been working in these ecosystems for decades because of the richness of rare plant species in these remnant grassland communities. But despite that, there's still a lot of knowledge gaps that persist, especially on climate change impacts and some of these other emerging threats. So the goal of the project that we'll be talking about today was really to bring together grassland experts from across the Southeast um, to identify and clarify these science needs. And the form of that, we began with outreach um, that culminated in a workshop. And then uh, the proceedings of that workshop um, are, are going to be published as a white paper later this year. So I'll talk a little bit about specifically the workshop, um, how we did it, and some of the results from it. Uh, it was held in uh, January of this year. Uh, seems like a million years ago because we had a whole bunch of people in a room together um, back in January. We were really fortunate to be able to do that uh, at the Bridgestone Americas facility in Morrison, Tennessee, and folks came from all over the region to join us. Um, the workshop steering committee, uh, we want to thank all of these folks for the time that they put into uh, planning and organizing the workshop and really making it a success. Uh, these are the folks who um, helped with the outreach and developing uh, participant lists, crafted the agenda, um, did all the logistics um, to make it happen. So we want to thank all of these folks. Uh, Duane mentioned already Reed Noss, uh, who literally wrote the book on this topic, and he served as the lead science advisor for this project, and he's the lead author of the white paper that's coming out of the workshop. So he's really the one who has um, taken all of this uh, rich experience, um, opinions, insight, wisdom from all of these participants, and is distilling it down into a document that can really um, uh, document everything that, that happened in the workshop and serve as kind of a roadmap um, for the future. So who were the folks that were involved in the workshop? Um, they came from not only southeastern states, but somewhat beyond that, from Texas to Pennsylvania to Florida. Um, a lot of state and federal agencies, uh, but also universities, uh, some botanical gardens that are involved in um, conservation of rare grassland species and uh, nonprofit organizations. I won't read off all of these uh, workshop participants, but we really wanna thank all of these institutions for sharing uh, their, their, uh, their time, their expertise, and their uh, on the ground management experiences um, through this workshop process. So the approach, um, we started with a pre-workshop survey and uh, that was sent really to everybody um, including folks who were not able to participate in person. Uh, so we were able to um, capture input that way. 
And then once everyone was assembled um, together for two days in January, we started with some introductory presentations to lay the groundwork. And then most of that two days was spent in World Cafe style uh, small group discussions where there were um, each group had a note taker and a facilitator. And then the note takers were really responsible for um, you know, maintaining all of those records and then distilling them down so that they could then uh, be published in this white paper uh, later this year. So I'll start with some of the results from the uh, uh, survey that we did at the beginning of the workshop. And uh, there were a lot more questions than I have time to cover here today, but all of that will be uh, covered in the white paper. So one of the questions uh, that was asked were, what are some of the biggest risks to southeastern grasslands? Um, no surprise, the top three uh, risks that folks mentioned were development and urban sprawl. Um, Duane already showed us a lot of what that has looked like historically in, in our region. Um, woody encroachment, which of course is related to um, alteration of uh, historical fire regimes and other disturbance regimes and invasive species. Uh, folks also mentioned agricultural conversion and just general lack of public support and awareness of the importance of grasslands. Biggest barriers to effective management, again, no surprise here, not enough money, not enough people, not enough time. Uh, that's something that is pretty common story among managers, um, including those who are trying to conserve these remnant grasslands of our region. Um, also mentioned were limited or outdated scientific information, lack of public awareness and support, and then challenges sometimes in translating science into management uh, decisions. What kinds of research are most needed? This was really the, the gist of what the workshop was ultimately about. Um, the top three that were mentioned were uh, grassland mapping and connectivity, including some of those historic distribution, historical distributions that Duane was talking about, where were grasslands historically. Um, the role of prescribed fire, of course, is important, but there's still a lot of um, specific management questions around that. And then uh, climate change, including changing hydrology, for example, changing seasonal uh, soil moisture patterns, things of that nature. Also mentioned were uh, research on individual species of conservation concern, uh, more generally species inventories and uh, research on pollinator networks. And then some of the results that came out of the small group discussions, there were five uh, general topics and they were habitat loss and fragmentation, climate change, changes to disturbance regimes, invasive species, localized impacts, and um, I'm only gonna do just touch on each of these very briefly. There's a lot more information in the white paper that's uh, coming out later this year. And of course, as you look at these, you can imagine that there was a lot of overlap between these topics and we, we anticipated that and, and that's um, accommodated in the, the kinds of responses that we got. So for the habitat loss and fragmentation group, um, which uh, or topic, actually all of the participants rotated through all of the topics. Um, the main research needs that were identified were um, improved mapping and uh, land use modeling specifically for particular kinds of grassland habitats. Research is needed on um, naturally fragmented grasslands such as some of our glade communities that were uh, you know, fragmented even before um, human modification of the landscape. Um, research and education needed on some human maintained grasslands like power line corridors. A lot of folks from the general public uh, don't uh, appreciate the importance, for example, of uh, TVA rights of way in maintaining, you know, real richness of grassland biodiversity in our region. Uh, research is needed on the kinds of thresholds for um, patch sizes that are necessary to maintain population viability of some grassland dependent species and um, then pollination and dispersal, um, how that is working now among uh, increasingly fragmented grassland patches. The climate change topic, again, many uh, other topics that were uh, addressed beyond just those uh, here that are coming out in the white paper. Um, but just a few of these included uh, the role of climate in historical grassland distribution. So we know that things like soil types and uh, disturbance, fire, uh, land use, all of those mattered in terms of where grasslands were historically. But what specifically is the role of climate interacting with those other factors? 
uh, we need to think about grasslands that can and can't move in terms of species that are tracking changing climate conditions. You know, if you think about species that might be restricted to serpentine uh, soils, for example, they may be less able to just uh, move to track changing climate conditions because they have some, um, you know, uh, geologic or, or, or soil constraints on where they can occur. Um, we need more information on specific sort of climate triggers and physiological thresholds for local extirpations and conversely so sort of for sustaining population viability over the long term. How is climate affecting uh, reproductive phenology? Um, for example, cold season triggers for bud burst. Uh, we talk some about the issue with increasing freeze thaw oscillations in winter. And then, uh, you know, of course, climate change is also changing the management options and constraints on the landscape, for example, prescribed burns. Uh, <clears throat> changes to disturbance regimes specifically, um, overlapping a lot with climate change, of course. Um, you know, to start with, just research is needed on the disturbance regimes, you know, fire or bivory under which grassland species originally evolved and to which they are adapted. You know, if we're trying to restore back to some uh, disturbance regime, you know, what is that? Uh, land use impacts on using prescribed fire to try to mimic some of those natural disturbance regimes. For example, grasslands that are increasingly surrounded by development, you have issues with smoke management, public perception that managers have to consider. Uh, what are some of the roles or importance of unburned patches or fire refugia within uh, prescribed fire perimeters, for example, for invertebrates, animal species that might require those? Um, what are some of the climate impacts on fire return intervals and, uh, and, and how those are changing? And then, of course, other kinds of disturbance beyond fire, um, herbivory, grazing, and how those can be um, mimicked or maintained by uh, management now into the future. Invasive species topic, a whole lot here to consider. Again, these are just a few of the things that were raised. Um, the need for a centralized repository uh, for tracking and mapping um, across the many different state invasive plant councils. Um, needs for early detection and early warning systems for managers. Uh, changing vulnerability of grasslands to invasion due to climate change. So how is climate change sort of um, affecting uh, how grasslands are being invaded? And then uh, conversely, what about, you know, the, the, where we do have on the landscape uh, small remnant patches of intact or old growth grasslands? How resilient are those to invasive species and how, is, how might that be changing? And then where managers are using um, herbicide as a, as a tool to um, try to control invasives, there's a need for toxicity tests uh, for different herbicides on different rare plant and animal um, populations. Um, and then finally, the last topic was um, localized impacts. So that was sort of asking folks, you know, what is happening in your neck of the woods? Um, things that might be not be applicable for all grasslands of the region, but might be of particular importance um, in, in different localized contexts. So um, folks mentioned uh, high elevation grasslands um, in the Ozarks and the Appalachian Mountains, where, you know, we know there's uh, upslope migration of forests and this concern that some high elevation grasslands uh, may have nowhere to go because they can't really migrate any further upslope. Um, I guess on the other end of the elevation gradient you've got uh, in coastal areas you have humans, you know, people that are uh, migrating inland away from uh, sea level rise and then how might some of that those land use changes impact uh, coastal grasslands. Um, Dwayne mentioned river scour uh, communities and those are these um, grasslands that are maintained by these um, episodic uh, floods that uh, carry a lot of debris and just uh, mechanically kind of scour um, and remove the woody vegetation and maintain these open plant communities that are really uh, rich in biodiversity. But how are those being affected uh, by stream flow changes from uh, dams and other impoundments and from climate change? Um, in some uh, glades and cobble bars, rock picking for the landscape industry is a concern. Uh, for grasslands increasingly that are adjacent to crop fields, there may be some issues with pesticide drift. 
And then one idea that um, was really interesting and got a lot of uh, uh, attention and enthusiasm was this idea of that we need a Zillow or something like that for uh, conservation land purchases to match um, buyers and sellers uh, for things like um, you know, uh, conservation purpose uh, purchases and conservation easements. So um, now we're going to kind of transition from uh, some of those uh, science needs that were identified in this workshop to some of the regional conservation efforts. Um, and I'll, I'll just say that the, you know, the science needs are, as we, as we discussed, are being synthesized into this white paper that will be published later this year. Um, there's a, going to be a new CCAS funded grasslands research project that's going to start up this fall. Um, that will involve uh, some geospatial analysis looking at, among other things, uh, climate change, invasive species, urbanization, and uh, prescribed burn window changes for um, eight to 10 grassland ecosystems uh, throughout the southeast. And then also some field experiments in uh, remnant tall grass prairie to look at some of the effects of climate warming and invasive species. So those are some of the next steps sort of on the science side. And then um, Duane and Rua are going to talk about um, moving from that research, how that also is uh, interacting with education and outreach efforts, regional partnerships, and on the ground uh, conservation in the region. So Duane, I'll turn it over to you. I can keep uh, running the slides and you can just yeah. say next. Sounds good. Thank you, Jen. We'll go ahead to the next slide here and um, I'll tell you just a little bit about the Southeastern Grasslands Initiative. Uh, we formed in 2018, uh, but really started a whole year planning before that. And we have four programmatic priorities and that is to uh, provide uh, leadership and uh, implementation, uh, leadership both in terms of the production of of uh, educational materials such as um, documentaries and publications, but also providing leadership on the ground. We're working to station uh, regional coordinating ecologists on the ground. We've got uh, new positions that are based out of uh, Nashville, uh, Clarksville, Tennessee, Chattanooga, uh, and soon to have um, a couple others. We've got one um, in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So we're really excited about that growing, um, our growing uh, coordinator positions on the ground. Um, certainly working with policy and advocacy is important for us. Um, we are really committed to education and outreach as a means of building capacity for grassland conservation. Uh, we want to build um, basically outdoor community centers with people who are inspired to uh, study and research and help restore grasslands in their own backyards. And a long-term vision that we have um, is to establish a granting program uh, through SGI as well. We have eight conservation uh, strategies, and these include uh, many of the standard things in conservation like preservation and restoration. I'll just give you a couple quick examples of, of the kinds of things we're working on there. So in, in terms of preservation, we're working with the Tennessee Department of Transportation to identify and preserve roadside remnant grasslands. That, um, that need to be uh, carefully managed. Uh, in terms of restoration, we're working closely with uh, Google to restore. In fact, we'll be planting uh, 50 acres of prairie tomorrow with a real high diversity local genotype mix. And so, um, you know, through numerous kinds of activities like that, uh, we'll be developing a seed bank this summer, again, with funding from Google that will serve the Mid-South region with an emphasis on grassland species. Um, and so um, we're, we're just really um, excited to, um, you know, to be on the scene and to be able to work in close collaboration with many uh, partners. Next. And so part of what we uh, aspire to do is to help what we call chart a new course for conservation. Um, throughout much of the 20th century, there was a lot of great work that focused on especially forests and wetlands but not uh, a lot of focus and attention was given by the conservation community at a broad regional scale for focusing on grasslands. And again, Reed's book had a big uh, hand in helping us to identify that as a major conservation need. And we want to follow the words of E.O. Wilson by make, making grassland systems a priority. 
And so SGI realized that while there's great work going on at many local regions on grassland conservation, there was still very much a void for leadership of grasslands conservation at a wide regional scale. And that's where SGI feels like it can play an important role. And so through careful strategic planning, focused on grasslands, working across state and eco-region boundaries and developing partnerships, we believe in dreaming big, but also making sure we have attention to detail. And we're looking for funding from major philanthropic sources and corporate sources and, uh, and working with our government partners. And so next, um, we uh, will be embarking this summer um, under the leadership of Dr. Reed Noss, um, who will be working uh, for SGI as a contractor, along with our co-founder, Theo Witzel, and Dr. Alan Weekly, our chief botanist, who's based at North Carolina Botanical Garden. Um, they will be leading a, a highly collaborative effort with other agencies and NGOs and other partners to develop a regional conservation status assessment and conservation plan focused on the grassland ecosystems of the Cumberland Plateau ecoregion. That's about a four million acre area that stretches across parts of Alabama, Georgia, Tennessee, and Kentucky. And so what we'd like to do going forth is to facilitate and help grow those similar kinds of regional planning efforts. And um, I'm gonna now turn it over to uh, Rua, who's gonna tell you about some of the regional efforts going on in the Piedmont. Awesome, thanks Dwayne. And so we'll zoom into uh, the Piedmont here. And I would say pretty much all the stuff that, that Jen and, and Dwayne talked about setting up very much applies to the, the Piedmont. I almost think it's kind of turned up to 11. You know, we've got the issues of, of urban growth, but in the Piedmont, you have some of the highest growth urban mega regions in the entire South. Um, and as far as kind of the history of trying to figure out what these look like, we had some of the earliest European colonization um, coming into the sort of coastal plain and then to the Piedmont. And so, um, you know, tracking some of these things and the, the level of threats have been, been pretty huge. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the Piedmont Prairie Partnership, um, but I first wanted to talk about the connection to the South Atlantic Blueprint, um, since this is that uh, co-authored webinar. Go ahead, go to the next one, Jen. Uh, so the, the connection with the South Atlantic Blueprint started really early as we were developing this kind of shared plan for conservation action, and it started with our early testing of the indicators um, not working well for Piedmont prairie plants. You know, we looked at threatened endangered plants um, in the Piedmont and they just, they weren't working very well. And it's because so many of them are hanging on in these weird places where woody encroachment keeps getting knocked back like roadsides and power line cuts and some of these other issues, um, pretty much because they don't really have much of a choice. Um, and so that, that's, that started a, well, we need to look a little bit deeper into Piedmont prairies. At the same time, as Dwayne set up um, early along, uh, grasslands are really one of the ecosystems that's in the biggest trouble in the South. And if we look at the grasslands outside of sort of longleaf pine, those are farthest off track for meeting Southeastern ecosystem goals. We're kind of doing the worst. Dwayne showed the grassland birds, but you see it in all kinds of other components of, um, you know, the history of losing so much of this throughout the South. Uh, the other thing about Piedmont Prairies is that there's big opportunities to do more. You know, you've got a lot of, a lot of people, a lot of interest, a lot of potential um, that we didn't have as much organization around as we did in some other places. Um, Longleaf in the Coastal Plain is a great example. Um, and so this was a nice chance to um, not just improve how the blueprint works, but also try to meet those ecosystem goals and, and make things better in the Piedmont. We'll go to the next slide. Uh, so what has this partnership been doing? Um, well, the big thing we started with was targeted education. 70% um, you know, of the public in the Piedmont think it used to be dense forests as far as the eye can see. I mean, Dwayne talked about that myth of the squirrel, you know, and that historical understanding about what the area used to look like. Um, whereas most of the Piedmont was grasslands, um, you know, open tree savanna, open grasslands, you know, when we judge from the best data we have right now, historical accounts and, and models, uh, that's most of the Piedmont. And then, like a lot of these other systems, less than 1% of that historical grasslands is intact. Um, so that's far less than Longleaf or some of these other systems that we're so concerned about. Um, so the, this, this idea of um, we've been working on target education, not just sort of like we need people to learn this stuff, but have really focused broader as a partnership about 
what are the types of interventions as far as education that could help move conservation forward, um, that could help get more support for roadside kind of restoration programs and working power lines, that could help get more cities and counties and folks uh, to restore Piedmont prairies and, and those kind of things is what we've been highly targeting. If we go to the next slide. Uh, here's a couple examples done so far, um, made a couple of Piedmont Prairie videos uh, that kind of tell that story of the past um, kind of current and future of Piedmont uh, Prairies and that's, that's been pretty well received, lots of different views, actually made it into a film festival in North Carolina, uh, was virtually screened fairly recently. Um, because of COVID, but uh, so those have worked pretty well on, on that side and they've been shown in all kinds of different places throughout the Piedmont. Uh, we've also been working on building up um, prairies as kind of recreational and, and tourism assets. Uh, that's, I think, the importance of recreation tourism, especially outside, is something big that people are realizing even more importantly uh, with, with kind of COVID and, and that importance of being able to get outside. Um, but one of the things we've been seeing in spots throughout the Piedmont is different counties and places trying to use these prairies, you know, beautiful open areas with pollinators and flowers and all kinds of cool stuff, um, you know, as, as tourist assets, as places to visit. And so we've been working on building out this Piedmont Prairie Trail as this sort of recreational asset, um, kind of like you have birding trails and the pond trail down in South Carolina. Um, and so we've got been identifying these publicly accessible places and some stories around them that you could go visit and see and, and learn about those different prairies. So that's fairly early on. Uh, you can see the videos. You can learn more about this at, uh, at southeastgrasslands.org front slash Piedmont um, at the partnership website. And we also have this set up. So if you know of a prairie that's publicly accessible that we're missing in the Piedmont, you can go ahead and just add it right in there um, and, and submit it with some information, which is fairly cool. Go to the next one. At the same time, we've been doing some uh, mapping as well uh, at individual state level. This is these are some really awesome results uh, from folks in the Virginia Natural Heritage Program. Um, this is some of the stuff they've been doing. This is looking at restoration potential in Virginia. Uh, we've been doing some stuff in South Carolina, North Carolina, working on Georgia and Alabama and some of the other states to try to bring together that next level of mapping about not just where they are now, but where are these places that we could build back up um, that amazing network of, of grasslands that used to be in the Piedmont. So go to the next one. Uh, so how can you help? Um, I mean, I think a lot of y'all know that um, Dwayne talked about local seed sources and things like that, and there's a lot you can do on, on land you own and in your own backyard, which is really exciting. Um, there's a lot of interest. I've, we've gotten a lot of success with cities, counties, local land trusts on creating Piedmont prairies because it just hits on all cylinders. You know, it's like, you know, great for, for climate adaptation, you know, flowers, pollinators. It's a nice open something, look different. Um, so a lot of people really love them, especially as they're put together. Um, and of course, talking with power companies and your Department of Transportation when you have opportunities to help them. Um, to support managing the existing prairies and planting new ones uh, is really great. And then if you wanna get more involved in the Piedmont Prairie Partnership, uh, that same website that we'd sent before and that will be on the slides, um, at the very bottom, you can sign up for the newsletter and that's kind of a chance as we keep you all in the loop about chances to get involved. Um, so that's some major stuff. Uh, the other thing I was gonna mention, just in case you're watching the video, is this prairie right behind me. This is in McDowell Nature Center. Um, this was from the fall. Um, outside and near Charlotte. And that's what I got. Back to you, Jen. All right, uh, so to wrap it up, we have a lot of folks that we wanna acknowledge and thank, uh, just a few of them. Of course, the Southeast Climate Adaptation Science Center and the South Atlantic Conservation Blueprint. Um, everyone from the workshop steering committee and all of the uh, participants that made that a success. Uh, the Band Foundation, Bridgestone America is supporting a lot of SGI's work. And of course, everyone who is contributing their time and passion and expertise to conserving southeastern grasslands. So I think at this point we can take questions. Absolutely. I'd say we have about five or six minutes for questions. Um, I have a couple coming through in the chat box. So while you all think about additional questions that you might have, I'll go ahead and start there. Here's a really practical question that really speaks to the what can you do that you were bringing up, Rua. 
Um, Caitlin says, I own 22 acres in Northern Durham County and would like to convert 10 to 15 of those into a native mixed species grassland. Are there resources to help me do that, such as grants and species lists? What suggestions would you all have for her? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And I'm glad to connect you with some folks. There's actually even a little triangle Piedmont Prairie group and um, probably get in touch. I can get you connected with uh, Johnny Randall from the North Carolina Botanical Garden. Uh, they've been doing a lot on, um, on seed sources that are really local, even to the Durham area. Um, so I'm glad to make those connections. I don't know, Carrie, do we have email addresses from folks? Oh, there we go. Yep. For folks that registered, we do. Um, okay. So if you registered, if you joined without registering at the last, you know, as after we started, um, well, you could send it to me and we'll make sure that you actually it out. Caitlin Hillary just put my email address in the chat. So if you want to go ahead and um, I'm glad to connect you with some folks that can get you some local types and, and help you with any kind of um, grants or opportunities. And species list, that's another thing that um, Johnny in the Botanical Garden and some other folks have been um, working on specifically is some ones for, for this area of the Piedmont. So just send me an email and I'd be glad to connect you with that. Thanks. Um, another question from the chat from Jason. Did geospatial layers exist for the historical distribution of southeast grasslands? And if so, what is the resolution? Wayne, that's something you've been working on. Yeah, I can take that. So um, the, the different layers are uh, sort of variable right now uh, for different regions. So there's a new layer that will be coming out soon, thanks to Steve Simone and Josh Kelly, who have been uh, with EcoZone. For example, they've mapped about uh, 2.1 million acres of historic shortleaf pine savanna for the Cumberland Plateau based on some very rigorous modeling, some of the best I've seen. Uh, so that'll be coming out soon. And then uh, we at SGI have, um, we have mapped some easily mappable communities such as uh, various glades and barrens. Uh, Paul Nelson with the Central Harbor's Joint Venture has mapped um, something like 8,000 glades for the entire interior highlands region. Other regions like um, the Piedmont at this point and um, the Pennerwell Plain and some other big grasslands, they're in, um, because they were lost so early, we we're gonna have to rely on modeling to really um, accurately predict where they were. And a lot of modeling hasn't been done yet. So uh, you can go to our website, segrasslands.org, uh, look under resources. And we have a, um, a, a very developing um, geospatial data set there that you could use. But just know that it's very much incomplete. And that's a big effort we need to work on going forward. Yeah. And also, I think Dorian Jed had mentioned that um, Southeast Cask uh, project involved in grassless mapping. And so I think that'll be another good example of a good way of moving that forward and bringing together additional layers. Um, the thing we've been anchoring on so far in the Piedmont is the land fire biophysical settings. Um, you know, a lot of those sittings, even if they're not denoted as grasslands, the using the grassland species themselves that were in there um, tend to be pretty good indicators. So in that case, that's like a 30 meter pixel, I think 30 meter from what I remember, biophysical settings. Um, and so that's, if, if it's sort of something where we need to get our first cut, that's another complementary layer where we're missing existing data is taking those Piedmont associated species that are in those biophysical settings um, and mapping those too. Great, thanks. I'm gonna pause just in case someone wants to speak up with a verbal question, then I'll go back to the chat box. I would if I may, this is Jaime. Go for it. Okay, Dwayne, this is mostly for you. Um, I'm working with the uh, North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission and we're working at the uh, former Voice of America game land, they call it. And as you've seen it or aware of it, it's a beautiful grassland, but of course it was created or cleared out for uh, by the Voice of America. Although if you look at some photography dating back to the early 40s, it looks like the place was some form of uh, of grasslands, of, of the ones that you're talking about, meadows and, and so on and so forth. Um, all the conditions are present in the uh, coastal plains for, for, you know, for grassland. I mean, we see that in the longleaf pine ecosystem, but aside from that forested habitat, what was the uh, sort of historical nature extent of, of these 
open grasslands, given that the Henslow sparrow, I mean, right now the stronghold for the species is right there in eastern North Carolina, and you wonder how they how they managed. Um, I mean, of course they could have gone to marshes and what have you, but so I wonder if you had any historic insights as to uh, open grasslands in the uh, in, co in the coastal plain. That's a good question. I mean, you know, we definitely know about the importance of longleaf pine. Um, and then uh, the maps dating back into at least the 1680s show the Grand Savannah, which um, it's not perfectly mapped. Those maps were very, very poor, in fact. Uh, but they, um, the Grand Savannah could have applied to parts of the intercoastal plain or it likely also applied to the Piedmont. And, um, you know, the term savanna was, is today thought to be used to treat grasslands, but in the past, savanna was often used in some respects for treeless grasslands, like we might use the concept of prairie today. So I think that this, both the coastal plain and the savanna likely had uh, large swaths or stretches of uh, treeless patches that could have covered anywhere from hundreds, which is certainly a, a big enough size, even if it's just a, a, a few dozen, for Henslow's, but uh, likely on the order of dozens to hundreds to thousands of acres locally, whereas savannas would have been probably the predominant landscape type. Yeah. And so um, I think that's what the historic landscape was like. And we know though from quotes as early uh, uh, that many of the big grasslands of the Carolinas, especially Carolina Piedmont, were gone by 1776 and had already been converted to uh, forest as a result of fire suppression. Uh, so it happened before our nation was founded, is what we're talking about with the beginning of the massive loss of these uh, grassland ecosystems. Mm -hmm. yeah. Appreciate it. Thanks Thank so you. much for that. That's a great question and um, thorough answer. I wish I had time to take more of y'all's great questions in the chat, but we do need to move on just for time. Um, what we could maybe do is if any of the presenters are, are willing to stick around a little bit late, we could revisit some of these questions afterward. But before everyone leaves, um, Ashlyn, if you wouldn't mind putting up the slide showing the preview of next month's web forum, I just wanted to give you all a little bit of a sneak peek um, of what to expect for July. Thank you, Ashlyn. Um, so next month, we're gonna be hearing from Dr. John Kupfer, who is a professor in the Department of Geography at the University of South Carolina. And he's gonna be presenting on something that actually ties in really well with what we were just talking about, which is the connection between longleaf um, and fire, which of course relates very much to grasslands. His presentation is gonna be on perspectives on prescribed fire management in longleaf pine ecosystems the context of landscape transformation and anthropogenic climate change. Um, so as most of us probably know, longleaf pine obviously has been subjected to a major decline um, over the over recent history from landscape conversion, logging, fire suppression, lots of other things. And so there's been a massive effort to, to restore longleaf pine and one of the major tools in that restoration effort is prescribed fire. But um, the use of prescribed fire to maintain and restore biodiversity and and restore longleaf might be getting a little bit more complicated with uh, wildfire risk uh, due to climate change, potentially limiting prescribed burning opportunities. So Dr. Kupfer is gonna be presenting the initial results of a survey that was designed to provide some baseline information on what criteria managers are using on prioritizing potential burn sites, current burning practices and limitations, and expectations for future change in burning constraints due to climate change. So, he has about 300 responses from fire managers across the southeast and is going to present those results on the overall patterns and sub-regional trends and seasonal timing uh, goals and risk calculations associated with longleaf pine burning um, and identify some challenges that regional fire managers expect to face over the next 50 years. So that should be a really interesting talk from Dr. Kupfer. So I do want to just thank our presenters so much for joining us today and for all of you for tuning in. Um, if you guys are willing to stick around for a few minutes and address some additional questions, um, feel free to stick around, but I just wanted to make sure that, that those who needed to leave at 11 were free to do so. Um, some other things that have been mentioned in the chat box, uh, what research exists looking specifically at fire regimes and grasslands and what do research needs look like for those topics? Jen, you want to take a stab? Or Rua, would you like me to? How, how would you guess? Hmm. Hey. Jen. I can add a little bit about what's uh, been done from the Mid-South region. Um, 
in terms of uh, research on fire regimes. Um, you know, a lot of that is, um, I think, based on some dendroecological work. Um, within the greater south, a lot of that work has been focused in the interior highlands region of uh, the Ozarks and uh, the Washita's. East of the Mississippi and the interior, a lot of the den dendro work has been focused in the Blue Ridge and some parts of the Northern Ridge and Valley, like up near Pennsylvania. Uh, there's been a lot less focus on looking at tree ring records, um, say west of the Smokies and in so the Cumberland Plateau of Tennessee, for example, the interior plateaus and much of uh, the intercoastal plain, Mississippi alluvial plain, there's been very, very little in some places, almost none. Some of the work that has been done recently, I'll just highlight is uh, that of Rich Guyette and Mike Stambaugh from Central Tennessee, uh, particularly Arnold Air Force Base in 2016, they published a really extensive paper where they were able to look at fire uh, return intervals and, and showed that it uh, occurs at about uh, an average of about every three to five years, but that's an underestimate. And that dates back, I think, to a 1610, I believe is the beginning to start date of that chronology. So that's ample enough fire uh, for maintaining uh, oak savanna habitat in the case of Arnold Air Force Base. We need a lot more of that kind of research uh, in many more areas across the South. So tree ring research is very important for informing fire records. Yeah, and I would just say it's, you know, it's going to be highly variable from different grassland types, both in terms of what fire return intervals look like and also sort of the ecological importance that fire had, right? So a lot of that research that's been done in uh, sort of large patch savannas is not going to be at all the same if you look at something like a bog or a fen, but, or even some of the like adaptive grasslands like glades that mostly perhaps have been maintained just because of very shallow soil. But that doesn't necessarily mean that fire wasn't also important in some way, but it's just been studied less. Yeah, as a quick follow-up to that, just um, I think it's increasingly we're realizing it's very important for us to get something right that we necessarily have, not necessarily have been getting right in some places across the South, and that is the timing of fire. So we know that, you know, growing season fires are important for the wiregrass, longleaf communities, uh, but the application of growing season fire in, say, Southern Missouri is, is showing very deleterious impacts to conservative species of plants and, and in some cases, animals. So there is, um, there's a need for growing season fire in some regions, there's a need for dormant season fires in others, I think it's really important we figure out where those uh, seasonality uh, needs come into play and not assume that all fire necessarily is good fire because we are definitely mm -hmm. seeing that fire can be detrimental in some regions of the Southeast when applied incorrectly. That's interesting. Thank you for addressing that question. Um, one other comment in the chat box, less of a question, maybe a recommendation. Um, one challenge for grassland restoration can be uh, when conservation agencies and entities work at cross purposes. And so a suggestion to encourage grassland restoration efforts to coordinate with their state departments of forestry to ensure that reforestation isn't running against the grain of grasslands preservation. And that got dis discussed a lot at the workshop in January of afforestation efforts and you know, even the, just the general public mindset that conservation in the Southeast means tree planting Gotcha. Right. Yeah. Yeah, the, because of the five states of conservation that I mentioned in, in my portion of the talk, um, the one that holds the greatest promise in terms of being able to restore the most amount of acreage is the, is the number five type, the easily or highly restorable types. And that largely are the uh, savannas that have been fire suppressed and now exist as closed canopy forests. And what, uh, while there is, obviously hundreds of thousands of acres of potential there. And many of our public lands across the South um, are the keys to that massive restoration potential. The public acceptance of going in and doing prescribed uh, fire and uh, selective canopy thinning, in some cases, very, very strong amounts of thinning is not going to be popular. And there has to be a, a really a, a good science-based and history-based, we can't forget the historical record as an equally important angle there. We have to begin to work to educate the public and our partners as to why it's so imperative for us to think about thinning forests and restoring them back into savanna conditions. 
The last thing I'll say is I know that there are some in the Southeast who maybe are a bit suspicious of SGI's motivations and think, well, you know, I don't know. They just want to create a bunch of grasslands everywhere. And that's not true for us. We, are very, we have a very strong fidelity to making sure that natural forests that are close canopy should stay that way, uh, but that habitats that should be more open woodland, open savanna be restored that way. And so we are all about uh, making, we love forests just as much as we love grasslands. And I think that's an important point I'd like to make from our point, our, yeah. our perspective. And this question actually intersects with the question about um, sort of the role of grass, grasslands and carbon sequestration, because some of the pressure, especially the mountains and stuff like that is like, oh, if we need to sequester for carbon, we need to plant more and more in dense trees. And so I think the other, the other message we, we um, try to incorporate that in, in our messaging too, is this whole idea of grasslands and these sort of open savannas role in carbon sequestration. You know, this idea that, you know, in an increasing, you know, a hotter, drier world where you're going to need things that are more resilient to drought, um, but also with increased threats from wildfires, the fact that grasslands are storing that carbon in kind of roots and underground and in the soil versus up in trees that can burn and then basically in catastrophic wildfire send that carbon back up in the air, I think is an important strength that we don't talk about enough. Um, and the relative difference between that, the carbon that's we're sequestering within uh, you know, that grassland tree savanna ecosystem versus in that dense artificial forest. That's also another kind of research need that we've been working on a little bit on, um, but it is an interaction about that cross purposes when you start thinking sequestration and um, yeah. That's a great point. Um, I'm gonna wrap things up with this one last question from the chat box. And thanks again to those of you who've stuck around. Um, Question from Bob Schwartz, who's a master's student at Hood College in West Central Maryland, who is interested in focusing his project on savanna and grassland habitats. Are there people or groups there in West Central Maryland that are working on this stuff uh, that could be a place for him to start? He mentioned SGI and partners are doing a ton of research all over. Is there a good place for him to find out how to get involved either formally or as a volunteer? Yeah, <clears throat> that's a great question. Um, you know, Maryland is uh, within our SGI's 23 state focal region. We go all the way up into um, central Pennsylvania and include New Jersey, uh, basically up to the glacial boundary. Um, we are still working to form partnerships and relationships at the northeastern edge of our range, which is very important to us. Uh, I think the people who right now we have the strongest connection with is the, um, the folks in Pennsylvania, like Chris Tracy with the Western Pennsylvania Conservancy. Uh, they are very um, uh, committed to looking at grasslands right there along the Maryland Pennsylvania border and uh, managing those and, and documenting their biodiversity. So there may be some uh, great opportunities right there across uh, the, over the line in Pennsylvania. Um, but there's definitely a, a history of uh, grasslands in Maryland, Delaware, Pennsylvania that is very uh, poorly understood. Uh, no doubt savannas were more important there historically in meadows and meadows and so forth. Um, I gave the example earlier from the Piedmont about how those savannas were lost prior to 1776 or prior to 1750 actually. Uh, we have a similar loss of grasslands in the central Maryland, eastern West Virginia, northern Virginia region. In fact, that was a large area that was called the Grand Prairie and it was just about an hour and a half or so west of Washington, D.C. Um, and, and that area is very poorly known. Hopefully there's still remnants in that region. This would be the area around Winchester, Virginia and Frederick, Maryland. So if you're familiar with that area, um, I would encourage you to look more into the historical record there. Finally, just go to our website, segrasslands.org, and you should be able to see a link there where you can sign up as a volunteer or to get our newsletter. And, and by all means, send me an email as well. And I'll be happy to interact with you directly. My email is duane.estes at segrasslands.org. Yeah, so you've got some good options depending on which, which direction from Hood College you want to work on. And I saw in the chat too, there's some good examples from some folks um, up in the national capital areas and the grasslands. Um, and then if you want to go a little bit south, um, we actually have um, in the Piedmont Prairie Partnership, we have someone from Fairfax County um, in Virginia. That's kind of our northern extent of our range as well. So um, there should be some good, good connections depending on what scale you want to work at and what... Um, Kind of what direction <laughs> from, from Hood College you want to go grassland-wise. 
Sounds great. Awesome suggestions. Thanks, folks. Good luck with your project, Bob. Sounds really cool. Um, all right, so that's it. Uh, in terms of questions in the chat box, um, Bob says thank you, everybody. <laughs> so thank you, Bob. thank you all for, for hanging in. Um, and of course, this, this uh, recording will be posted up um, in a week or so, um, as Carrie mentioned. So um, really appreciate everybody tuning in and hope you'll join us again in July. Have a great rest thank of the day. Thanks thank to you. our presenters and participants. <laughs> Bye, y'all. Bye, everybody. <laughs>